Okay, welcome back. We were talking about the trials of faith. And one of the trials of faith for you was our internet dropped you off. And so you, I finished the message, by the way, about an hour ago. No, I'm just kidding you. Uh, so I'm going to try and go back to where we were. And for us, it's a trial of faith because we're trying to get a message across and the computer stops. That's okay. That's not a problem. Because God's truth is God's truth. And the fact is this. We have a God who is in control always, including this situation. So relax. Relax. It's okay. Our faith will be tested. Our faith will be tried. But there's also victory when we keep looking at God. The Lord Jesus, when he heard them screaming when he walked on the water. By the way, have you in your mind ever wondered how when the waves are so high and the wind is strong and the sea, I mean, we go out here in Lake Roosevelt, I guess the biggest I've been on Lake Roosevelt is five feet of waves in our boat. And oh my goodness, is that crazy for this lake when the wind comes up from the south? How did Jesus walk on the water with that kind of waves? Was he bopping up and down? Was he walking right through it like a bow with the, the, the front part of a boat? I don't know how, but he was walking on the water. And they, when he heard their screams, he said, take courage, it is I. Literally, that says, I am. Take courage, I am. Do not be afraid. Literally, it is I am. He was claiming Godhead right there. Isaiah, 700 years before this time, Isaiah 51, 12 said this. I, even I am he who comforts you. Who are, uh, who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass? Isaiah said, through, through Isaiah, God was saying, I, even I am he who comforts you. And that's what Jesus did. And when he spoke, they recognized his voice. Remember a little bit earlier? We have this recorded in John chapter 10, beginning at verse 14. Jesus has said this, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my, sh my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they followed me. Here was Jesus teaching them, you hear my voice, respond to me. Don't respond to your fears. Don't respond to your imaginations. Don't respond to what you see around. Respond to me. And bless Peter's heart. Peter said, Lord, if that is you, command me to come out towards you. And so Jesus said, come. See, I'm not sure that Peter was thinking he was going to walk on water. I was thinking that Peter was going to jump in and perhaps kind of swim to Jesus supernaturally and Jesus save him. I don't know what Peter was thinking. Nobody ever walked on water. Jesus was the only that walked on water. But Peter actually walked on water. You know, when something like that happens, later on you process that because at the time you're just doing it. You process that and says, I wonder what happened. I actually walked on water. Not like they do in northern Minnesota in the wintertime when they walk on ice. That's not walking on water. He actually was walking on water. And when he got to Jesus, when he got to Jesus, and by the way, before I do that, I want to read you one verse. It's, it's one of my favorite verses, Hebrew 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of him, things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Peter was living that out. And Hebrew wasn't written till later on, but Peter was living that out. Lord, if that's you, tell me, command me to come and I will come. And Peter actually followed through because his eyes were on Jesus. From the fear of looking at the circumstances to recognizing the voice. I don't know how clear they could see him because the wind obviously was really strong, but he recognized the voice. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out and walked towards him. And actually walked towards him. And then as he got closer, his focus changed. And all of a sudden, it said he saw the wind. Actually, you can't see the wind. So he was seeing the effects of the wind, the white caps, the waves. You know, nice, the thing about waves in a stormy sea, whether it be out in the ocean or in a lake, the thing about waves is waves aren't 
smooth flowing things one way or the other, like on coastlines. On a nice day, the waves come in, they go out. Another wave comes in, they go out. In storms, waves are nasty. They're coming all kinds of ways. And it's very difficult to predict where the wave's going to hit you from. He looked and saw this. And all of a sudden says, oh my, I'm on water, the boat's back there, Jesus is there, but oh my, this is horrible. And he began to sink. Does that happen to you in life? Does that I know it happens to me. God calls me on, on a journey. I walk with him on a journey. And all of a sudden, I look at the circumstances and the circumstances overwhelm me. In my mind, I know God is God. I know he's called me. But all of a sudden, the reality, well, you know, we are real people. We got to live in this real world. Yeah, we have to live in this real world. But as resurrection people, we keep our eyes on Jesus. And when Jesus saw him sink, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out and took his hand. Then they walked back together to the boat. And Jesus made this statement. He said, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, many of us, and I've heard so many messages on this, Jesus rebukes Peter for lack of faith. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever walked on water? If you haven't walked on water, you have no right to criticize Peter. Peter. I can't. Because I don't know what it's like to walk on water. Well, Jesus rebuked him. No, I don't think Jesus rebuked him. Jesus was showing Peter something. First of all, do you realize that Jesus acknowledged Peter had faith? You see, we focus on that word little. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Take that little word little out. Oh, you of faith. He had faith. It was a little faith. In fact, six times, five or six times in the Gospels, and there are five passages actually in the New Testament that talk about little faith, and everyone used by the Lord Jesus. And I'm just going to quickly tell you this first one, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, when about seeking about God and trusting in the Lord. The second one is when he was sleeping in the boat and they tried to wake him up, and he said, Oh, you a little faith. In this passage, the third time this, uh, this word, Oh, ye of little faith, uh, was used. Uh, when he was teaching of the leavens of the Pharisees, and you find that in Matthew 16, 8, and Luke 17, 6, he again talked about little faith. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he came down, the disciples were trying to cast a demon out of this little boy, and he said, oh, you have little faith. Okay, when Jesus said, oh, you have little faith, was he rebuking them? I don't think he was rebuking them. I think he was teaching them. Why? For this reason. Because Jesus himself said, and listen to this. There's a couple of times he said this, but I'm just going to read you from Matthew, uh, read to you from the Matthew, from Matthew 17, 20. I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, very, very, very little faith, very, very small faith, you can say to this mountain, move from from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You see, it's not the size of faith. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Because what Jesus was pointing out was the aim of faith, was the object, was the who you had faith in. You have a little faith in me, you're okay. But if you have a little faith and you turn away from me and look around, you're not okay. Because the issue isn't how much faith you have. I tend to be real concerned about people who say, oh, I'm fine because my faith is strong. I have a big faith. Anybody who knows themselves well and anybody who knows God's God well will never say, I have a great faith. Because the more I know God, the more I see me. The more I see how big God is, the more I see how small I am. The more I, I see how small I am, the more I see how pathetic my faith is. You know, we talk about this person or that person, especially people from the past who, who God used wonderfully and say, boy, there were people of great faith. I'm going to suggest that they were people who had such a perspective of God that they honed and kept their focus on God because those people would be the ones that would know well how little a faith they had 
how wretched they were as people. The more you see God, if you turn your eyes on yourself, the more you see how nothing you are. See, when Jesus was saying this to Peter, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? His focus was on Peter. You need to keep looking at me. Peter keeps seeing me. And Jesus was going to continue to teach Peter this for the next little while until he, was, until he went to the cross. In many different ways, Peter, keep your eyes on me. Because you see, when I tell you to do something, I'm responsible for making that happen. For you, you keep your eyes on me. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't look at the opposition. Don't look at your own ability or inability. Look at me. The victory of faith comes as God teaches us more and more and more through the trials he allows us to experience in life. He teaches us more and more and more to keep our eyes zoned in on him, to keep looking at him, and not to get it off on the circumstances, certainly not to get it off on ourselves. You see, as you walk as a resurrection person in life, and as we walk as resurrected people in life, the thing that we need to keep encouraging each other about, the thing that we need to keep each other focused on is keep looking at Jesus, keep listening to him, Keep understanding him, read his word, get to know what his heart is like, and continue to follow him. The last thing you want to do as a resurrected person is get your directions from yourself, because I guarantee you you're going to mess up. But even worse, if you get it from somebody else. I remember stories, I've, I have so many stories of this where people who want to follow the Lord, and many of them are new or many of them are not well established in scripture, they listen especially to spiritual gurus or pastor, pastors. I remember one when, when this whole name it and claim it system started off and Dan and I were in Texas and Dallas. Well, we were north of Dallas actually. But there was this huge mega church that started out with this name it and claim it thing. I'm not going to say what it was. Some of you who are in that area know who I'm, who I'm talking about, who the person was. And he would claim that no matter how much you gave, even if you emptied your wallet and emptied your bank account to him, God was going to bless you. And I had this one man come to me. He had two little kids and a wife. He was a hard worker, made minimum wage, but he really got caught up in this. Over and over and over, he'd empty out everything he had, give it to them. They wouldn't have food. They couldn't pay their rent. They couldn't pay their taxes. It got so bad that not only were collectors coming after them, but they were, he was in physical danger for his own life. They had to run and hide. He kept coming to me, but the pastor said, the pastor said, the pastor said. And I says, well, get the pastor. What has God said? God's told you how to live. He never did. I, he left. I had no idea where they went. I know another family who were following, not the pastor, but one of the Christian gurus. And this person had the audacity to walk in their home anytime he wanted to. He would tell the, her, the wife, he would tell him, the husband, he would tell the children how to live. And because they want to follow God, because God spoke through him. What a screw up that came, resulted in in their lives. You see, you don't listen to people. You don't listen to me. In fact, I would say, suggest this. Whoever you listen to, and I'm going to bring it to myself personally, if you listen to me, be aware of the Spirit of God inside of you. If the Spirit of God inside of you puts up a check in something I'm saying, try and spend time with the Lord to see what that's about. Don't take it because I said it. If what I say the Lord affirms to you, then hold it as from the Lord. Because there's no human being that's fallible. In fact, one pastor said this is his past into eternity now, and I, I'm so thankful he said this. He says, understand this, the longer you're in ministry, the more words you speak, the more wrong you're going to be. It's like, yeah, I understand that. Am I trying to teach error? No, I'm not trying to teach error. I'm trying to stay with the Word of God. But it's important for you to develop your faith in Him. The whole focus of the ministry that we do at Community Bible Fellowship is to get your eyes on Him and follow Him because all of us are fallible. He is not. And as you walk with him, your faith will be tested. We need each other to support each other in that. Don't, don't, don't belittle a person when their, their faith is being tested in various ways. When they're in agony, when they're in fear, when they're crying out, walk with them. Keep having their eyes turned on Jesus. He 
You see, faith, as I said earlier on, faith is the very thing that allow when God takes our faith and molds our faith to get it focused on him and the longer we walk in life the more our faith is honed in on this focus and we're not going to let go of the focus that is what strong faith is maybe very little but it's a strong faith you can think you have a faith this big but you keep looking around circumstances keep swaying you you don't have much faith because who do you have faith in who do I have faith in that's what this is all about Let me read you a couple of verses. Uh, the first one is from Hebrew 12, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. As we believers walk with each other wherever we are, keep our eyes on Jesus. Have people walking with us that will keep our eyes honed on Jesus. Listen to him. Follow him. Because the promise is that he's going to grow you. And part of growing you is testing the faith. And sometimes, or oftentimes, the testing of the faith is when he's told you to go a certain way. And you begin to walk in obedience. And then the faith gets tested. Know that he's doing something inside of you that has eternal purposes. The other one I want to read is second, the other verse I want to read is 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. Paul wrote this The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. See, that's what God is doing in us. That is what God is doing in us so that we can be the broken bread and poured out wine to this world. We can be His people in this world as resurrection people. It's a glorious thing to be a resurrected person. It's a glorious thing to know where our heritage is. It's a glorious thing to know where we're going to live forever. But in this life, in this life, our walk isn't always so glorious. Yeah, we will experience a lot of joy. We'll experience a lot of wonderment at, at, at what God does. But we will also experience difficulties. We have already. It's not like we haven't. And there will be more ahead, especially in this world we live in. But God, by faith, wants us to listen to him and walk that out. And yes, our faith will be tested, but it will also yield results that we have no idea of. Only in eternity are we going to understand that. Uh, Thomas Brooks, a, a pastor in England who lived in the uh, early part of 1600s, he wrote something down. I don't know if he spoke it or he wrote it, but it's written down for us. And I love this because he kept his focus on eternal glory. Listen to what he said. A Christian knows that death shall be the funeral of all his sins, his sorrows, his afflictions, his temptations, his vexations, his oppressions, his persecutions. That's going to be the burial that takes place at his death. He knows that death shall be the resurrection of all his hopes, his joys, his delights, his comforts, his contemplations. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, as we walk, we know we're temporary residents here, but God is doing in us and doing through us his work that we get to participate with as these 12 apostles did, as many, many of his followers have throughout the world. And many of those followers throughout the world, Hebrew tells us the world wasn't worthy of them. They were treated and mis mistreated in horrible ways, but yet their faith, and their walk in the position God led them was to God's glory eternally and for their good. Family, hold on. Hold on to that reality. We are people of the resurrection. Our faith that we have in God is going to have rewards, is going to be able to continue to direct us as we listen to him walk. But our faith will also be tested. And it's not a strange thing. It's not an anomaly. It's a natural thing. Why? Because God is growing his kingdom in us and in the world through the testing of our faith. You see, I hope that this is not a discouraging message because it's not meant to be discouraging. It's meant to build you up. 
There's nothing wrong with you when you face trials, when you face temptations, when you face hardships. There's nothing wrong with you. God is doing his work to build you up. Keep your eyes on him. Even when you can't understand him, keep your eyes on him, your heart on him. Get to know his heart. Again, I've spoken many words. And I want you to just take a moment to quietly think about, and if you have a pencil or paper, jot down a couple of things that you sense the Spirit of God has told you, because you want to hold on to that. You don't want to leave it to later on, because if you leave it to later on, I, get, I promise you it's going to disappear. Hold on to it. I'm going to take a moment of silence, and I'm going to read one or more verse, and we'll close off with prayer. Again, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 30, 15, said this. This is what the sovereign Lord, Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance, turning around, and in rest is your salvation. In quietness and in trust is your strength. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, that your word is faithful, that you have given us what we need to know to walk the days of our life on this, in this world, to honor you, to glorify you. We thank you for these two incidences that we have recorded, the feeding of these thousands, and then your disciples in that boat, fearing death, and you coming along, and you revealing your glory. Thank you that that is not just historical information you want us to have. That's not a formula you want us to understand, but it's truth you want us to experience. You're revealing your heart to humanity. And Father, thank you that because you never change, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that that's the same God that you are in our lives. As we are gathered all over this country today through this podcast and, in, and also occasionally other parts of the world, I pray that your blessings will be on your people. May they, may they delight in you. May they glorify you. May they find their joy in you. And we do pray this in your son's holy and blessed name. Amen. I find it a lot easier to think of that, uh, to have faith when I think of that picture of Jesus coming as our resurrected Savior. For some reason, I think it's hard for us when we picture him and his um, human body that he took on. But he's the same God, and he has that same power in our lives. He is my faith.
He has never lost a battle. He has never lost a battle. Our great defender, our strong tower. He has never lost a battle. He has never lost a battle. So when listen to the sound of power on my lips, Jesus has broken the curse. He has never lost a battle. And who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? Jesus defeated the darkness. assurance is that God has never lost a battle and he never will. So take heart this week as you walk with him that he is your God. And as you walk close to him, whatever battles you face, he will never lose it. And keep your eyes on him. Just a reminder for those in this area, next week we meet again at the Kearney's on 89 More Road. So you're welcome to come. For those of you who can't make it or those of you who are following us online, we will have that uh, downstreaming. And if for some reason, uh, as happened today, and I think happened last week also, the internet stops, we will continue on uh, with the message so that you can continue to see it streamed online. We thank you for joining us. Know that your God, your God delights in you. May he bless you and may you have a wonderful week as you live in the palm of his love. Have a good day. Bye.